Welcome to Profit and Prosper, a podcast that will empower you to become financially independent as an entrepreneur. I'm your host, Sarah Young, an entrepreneur, wealth coach, and mentor to driven, ambitious female business owners who are ready to take action towards having a richer and more impactful life. I'm here to push you to think bigger about what's possible for your business and life, and I believe that your business is the best way to have more time and financial freedom. Just 10 years ago, I was $55,000 in debt and leaving a traumatic marriage as a 20-something. Fast forward to today, I now run a seven-figure agency with a team of 10 and growing and have built over a million dollars in net worth while balancing taking care of my health and prioritizing being a wife and mom. In this podcast, I will teach you how to scale your business, take home a six-figure paycheck, and save and invest for your financial future without having to sacrifice your life today. What's up, y'all? Welcome back to the podcast. We are going to wrap up the team series we've been doing with part three. And we're going to pretend I've called this series the Dream Team series the whole time because I just thought of that as I hit record on this episode. And I definitely didn't say that in the other episodes. So we're going to just haphazardly slap a name on this series and call it the Dream Team series because that's how I roll. Anywho, we really have been talking about the elements that you need to have a dream team. And so a dream team, in my mind, is a team that is full of people who are exactly the people that you need on your team. Um, They're great to work with. They do really high quality work. Overall, they help to grow and scale your business so that you can, you know, bring in more revenue, work less hours, pay yourself a solid paycheck pay your team a solid paycheck, everybody's happy. Like to me, that is a dream team. So in episode one, which was episode 90, go back and listen to that and episode 91 if you haven't. Um, In episode, the first part of the dream team series, episode 90, we talked about finding the right role that you need to hire next. Then we talked about in this, in part two, how to find the right person for the role. And today what we're gonna talk about is once you've found the right person, and they're in the right role, you've brought them into your business, how do you create the right culture? Because I think the right culture is the really crucial piece that a lot of people don't actually think about when you're thinking about hiring a team and growing a business is is having that culture in your business so that everybody's pulling together and people don't have different ideas about what's going on. Everybody's, like I said, pulling in the same direction, which means that your team is going to be more efficient, more effective, more high quality. Everybody's going to be happier. You're going to be happier. Things will be better. That's the, that is the topic of today. Before we jump in, quick reminder that this week is the final week of the Black Friday, Cyber Monday deals. I will never outside of Black Friday, Cyber Monday, at least as far as I plan now, will probably never have any discounts as deep as what I'm offering because I think Black Friday is super fun. So you can go to sarahhyoung.com forward slash Black Friday where we have all the deets, but high level, we've got 60% off all of my courses and masterclass replays. We have $2,000 off of a couple, a handful of spots inside Scaling Made Simple if those are still available, and then a few spots at a discount in private mentorship with me to start in January 2024 with a kickoff VIP day in the month of December. So go to sarahhyoung.com forward slash Black Friday to snatch those up before the deals expire. All right. So the reason I think that culture is so important, I mean, I kind of already talked about it, but I've been running my Young & Co. business for almost five years now, working with multiple six, seven, multi-seven, eight-figure entrepreneurs. And what I found shocking coming from the corporate world and from public accounting land, where I had some really amazing managers and people in leadership positions, and frankly, some crappy ones. But I would say all in all, I had some pretty good people um, in those positions who I was you know, brought up with, um, who mentored me, who taught me things. I was kind of shocked when I came into small business land at how many entrepreneurs at every level up to even the eight-figure ones we've worked with, how many of them struggle with leadership and team management? Like, I was honestly kind of shocked at this because I kind of thought, I made the assumption that if you're an entrepreneur, you're going to automatically be good at the leadership piece, at least because you kind of have to be a leader, in my opinion, to be a successful entrepreneur. 
But what I found is that I think, honestly, sometimes people can grow their business even if they aren't great at leadership or management, if they haven't developed those skills. And they probably could have even gotten farther or more profitably um, if they had developed those skills. I think the reality is that people struggle, business owners sometimes struggle with leading and managing a team because it takes time. It takes a lot of time to properly train and manage and lead your team. And a lot of times you think, oh, I'm going to hire a team and then I'm all of a sudden going to be able to work less. And yes, like absolutely you will get there, but you have to invest the time on your your behalf. And if you have a team, sometimes your team will have to invest time to train um, on an ongoing basis, even past the onboarding stage to have a team that runs really well. Like it's not just to set it and forget it. This is an ongoing thing because you're dealing with people and you're dealing with systems and businesses that change all the time. I think too, when we think about leadership and management, there's a lot of fear and guilt that comes with that. So it comes with leading and managing a team. There can be fear with anything from, you know, over communicating, like sharing your financials with the team. There can be fear about people leaving you. Like I've had a ton of really large businesses where, I mean, I'm talking like multi seven, eight figure businesses where the CEO or business owner will tell me like, if this one person leaves, the whole business is going under. (laughs) And so that's a lot of fear talking, right? That if it is actually true that you're tying your entire business to this one person being there, then we've got a problem. We've got to fix it, right? And there's also guilt, guilt over giving people negative feedback, giving people points to improve on, um, guilt in a lot of things, feeling tied to people who have spent a lot of time with you, even if they're not the right fit for the role that you have, for the business you have now. People who come in early on might not be the people who stay with you as you scale to the next level. And that is just a fact, right? As much as we wish people would stay with us forever, it's just not reality. You know, people move, people change, things change all the time. And ultimately, you have to be the one as the leader to do the best for your business and for yourself and your family. So before we talk about how to actually create the right culture with leadership and management skills, I want to talk about the difference in leadership and management because you can be both the leader and the manager, but you may not be right? You could be one or the other or both or neither, frankly. So leadership is what I would say is more about motivation and influence over the team and big picture strategy of the overall like vision and execution of the company, right? The leadership, I would say, is like when you think of a traditional corporate environment, I say the leaders are the C-suite versus managers. Management is more about the tactical piece of getting the group, getting everybody as a whole to whatever your desired outcome is. It can be more focused on like project and task management, reviewing work, just making sure like things actually get done um, when you have a team. So those can be two separate roles. And the reality is right now, like most of you are probably going to need to be both of those, especially as your team gets small. But as your team grows, we talked about this in the first part of the series where we have somebody who needs to do the work, somebody to review the work, somebody to manage clients, um, meet with clients, and then do marketing and sales, right? So as your business grows, you're going to have to hire people. Like as you get two to three people doing the work, you're going to need to hire somebody to re- then review the work, to be the manager, right? Because it's going to get to the point where you just physically cannot be the manager for all those people anymore. So now that we've talked a little bit about the difference in leadership and management, I have come up with five things that you need to create the right culture and to build your dream team. The number one thing that you need in order to do that is to be the leader. Some of you may have heard me talk about this. My first ever job uh, in accounting after I got my master's was at Deloitte. I was an auditor in public accounting. So Deloitte is one of the big four firms. I was there for about four years. And one of the things we audited for was fraud. When we talk about when we learned about fraud and identifying potential opportunities for fraud to occur, one of the most important things we talked about was tone at the top. And what that means is whether the people in the top positions are being effective leaders or not, and that the tone, the way that they led their team, the way that they led themselves 
would trickle down through the rest of the company as a whole. Even with multi-billion dollar corporations, this was still true of the C-suite. And so the tone at the top really means that you are being a leader and that you're living out your values. So if you're saying one thing to your team, but then doing something completely different, that's going to not be a solid tone at the top. You're not going to be an effective leader because your team is going to see, well, she says she wants this, but she's actually doing this. And then they are going to continue. They're going to think and act the same way that you are. One of the things that I talk about when I hire a team at Young & Co. is that my goal is that we don't have the traditional accounting firm where everybody is overworked. Like I want us all to have really great work-life balance, even though I don't love that term, but still like to have work-life balance, meaning we're not overworked, right? And of course, there's times when things are busy, but the goal is that I'm not running my team into the ground. I'm not doing the traditional corporate public accounting thing of working accountants 80, 100 hours a week all the time. So what would they think if I said that and then I was working 80 to 100 hours a week all the time, right? Because they would see me working. They would see the emails. They would see the Slack messages come through. Like they would see things in our task management system, how am I providing good tone at the top if I'm telling them one thing and I'm not living out those values? And so I think this goes back to you as a leader. When you say what your values are, do you actually embody those? So I think we can all do better to fully embody our values because people see you as a leader and they're going to do the same thing <laughs> that you do. Number two is setting and communicating clear expectations. I think this is one where people get a little bit scared of actually saying out loud some of the things that they want their team to do. And so when we talked about in the previous episodes in the series, writing a very clear job description, like being 10 times clearer than what you think you need to be, this is why. Because you can't expect your team to do something that you have not communicated to them to do. An example could be, like, let's say I hire somebody and I say, okay, I want you to post on social media, run my social media. So like, okay, great. I'll go run your social media. And they go off and they start posting and doing the things, except what happens is I don't like the post. I don't like the stuff they're talking about. I don't like the design. I think that, you know, it's maybe not converting to sales. And part of the reason is it's on me as the leader to make sure that I communicate to them exactly the way that I want that done. How do I define success? How do I define failure? I think you have to define both of those things. It's really just about like transparent, open, honest communication. I think this is both a leadership and a management skill. And again, a lot of CEOs will be afraid, I think, to be super transparent because they're carrying some like fear or shame around letting people into their businesses, either because they're thinking like, well, what if they judge me for how I've done so far? Or what if they judge me for what I spend my money on or whatever? Obviously, like communicate to people what you feel is appropriate to communicate. I'm not saying you have to like open up the trench coat and let them like see it all. But I do think that with your team, especially your right-hand people, it's really important to set like very clear expectations to them and communicate frequently about what those expectations are anytime you assign them a project. And then to also be open and honest about how the business is going so that they can help you. People can't help you if you don't tell them what's going on. So number two is clear communication and expectations for your team so that they can actually do what you want them to do. Because if everything's in your head, they don't know what's in your head. They're not mind readers. Therefore, they won't be able to do the things you want them to do. Number three is kind of a continuation of that. And that is doing performance reviews on a regular basis. I recommend at least twice a year, if not quarterly. I won't lie. When I first hired my team, I did not do these formally because I had kind of PTSD from the corporate days of how just awkward these meetings can be. But as my team has grown, I have realized that it is actually really important to have performance reviews on a regular basis because it's just stuff that doesn't come up in the day to day. So when you write your job descriptions, you know, I said to be really clear about what the job duties are. And in the last little bullet, I said to have very clear expectations. What we do in our business at Young & Co., and this is what some of our clients also do, 
we created rubrics of, you know, being able to list out basically in a big spreadsheet every job description, everything that they need to be doing from, you know, work product, time management, organization, problem solving, strategy, team, communication, like everything they need to do down in a spreadsheet. And we have guidelines for what it looks like to meet expectations, what it looks like to exceed expectations, and what it looks like to not meet expectations. And so what my team has recently started doing is we go through, the team member goes through, and they get the rubric. They see what we, you know, expect them to do. They rate themselves as either not meeting expectations, meeting them, or exceeding And then we sit down, the manager, every manager meets with their direct reports and they go through the performance reviews quarterly. And the reason that this is helpful is because it really takes out the guesswork on the part of the team member for knowing what success looks like for them. Because generally speaking, people want to do a good job. And people also like to have things as clear as possible and so to not have gray area. And so the reason I like this is just because it takes the guesswork out and it makes it very clear to the team member whether they're meeting expectations or not. And it tells them, hey, you're doing great in these areas and let's improve in these. So when we have the performance reviews, we also talk about goals and how they fit into the performance rubrics. And then if there's team members who want to expand their roles, who want to move up into a higher level role, then we can talk about, okay, you need to be exceeding expectations in your current role to be able to move up into the next one. Like I'm not saying they have to do the next role before they're paid for it, but I'm saying to see the potential for them to take on the higher level responsibility. So you can have those conversations and they fit in really well and it just takes out all the guesswork. You know, I've, like I said, in some of the previous episodes, I've managed teams in my corporate life of up to almost 25 people. And sometimes you'll have managers who don't communicate to their teams, who don't give feedback. And then the manager would come to me and say that they're frustrated with how the team's performing or they're, fr- they're frustrated because they're having to do a lot of cleanup work and a lot of repeat comments on work. And my question is always, well, have you told the team member? Have you given them the feedback? And a lot of times the answer is either yes, but maybe not clearly enough, or no, they haven't gave, given the feedback because, again, it takes time to train and manage your team. So this is why I like the performance reviews. It just gives them a very clear path to feedback. And I think it you can put stuff in there about your company's values and culture so that if people aren't a great fit for your culture, you can see that in the rubrics. Okay, so that's number three. Number four is consistent delegation and training. So this one can be hard because it takes time to delegate and train. And I have a lot of people, myself included, I have to work on this too. You'll tell yourself, okay, it'll be a lot faster if I just do this versus letting my team member do it. While that may be true, you may be able to do things faster and better. Your team will never improve if you don't delegate. And so you have to delegate. And what that means is you have to practice every single week identifying things that you can give to your team member. And then you also have to carve out time every week to review that work and give them feedback. So, you know, if your team sends you something and you review it and you have to change 10 things, they need to know that you change the 10 things so that the next time you delegate that task, they can do it better. And again, I realize that that takes time to do when you're already probably feeling busy But this is one of those things where you put in some time now and in the long run, it is going to help you so, so much. I am in a place currently where in Young & Co, I probably work on average 15 to 20 hours a week in that business and then another 10 to 15 in my coaching business. I would not be able to do what I've done on the hours that I currently work if I had not taken the time to delegate to and train to my team. Because if I was still doing all the work and still fixing it all, I would still be working 50, 60 hours a week every week, nights and weekends all the time. And we're just, you have to take the time to do that, okay? Now, one really quick tip before we move on to number five is when you're training people, I recommend, unless they can handle it, but I recommend not necessarily throwing everything at them all at once. So as an example, if you review work that they do and you've got 10 things to fix, I might choose to send back half of the things for them to fix now and then fix the rest myself. And then the next time they send me the same thing, 
hopefully they will have fixed the first five and then I'm going to send the next five to them. Because sometimes I think depending on timelines too, if you try to get them to fix all 10, it can be overwhelming to them. It can be overwhelming to you. So sometimes you have to take baby steps. So that is just part of training. Okay, so the last piece is weekly management and FaceTime with your team. So again, taking time every week, non-negotiable time on your calendar to spend with your team. One of the things I tell my clients inside my programs is that you as a CEO have four areas that you need to really focus your time on. It's making sales, big picture strategy, taking care of yourself, and team leadership. We need to have non-negotiable time on your calendar every single week for team leadership, for team management also. And so you're going to have to figure out what that looks like for your team because every business and every team is different. But I think that it's important to have weekly FaceTime, at least biweekly FaceTime. And what I mean is have a Zoom call because I think it's very different than always talking to people in Slack versus actually having a call where you can see people's faces and they can see like, oh, you know, Sarah's also a person. Like reminder that Sarah's here and Sarah has a face and Sarah's not a mean person, (laughs) hopefully. So weekly management can look like a lot of different things. You know, you can choose to have different cadences. What we do at Young & Co. is on Mondays, typically, I've got a tax manager and an accounting manager. The tax manager meets with the tax team. The accounting manager meets with the accounting team, and they have their own team meetings. We used to have one combined meeting, but now the team's too big. So they'll have their own team meetings where they talk about what's happening, the projects for the week, work assignments for the week, planning, issues popping up. There's just a time where they literally get on a Zoom call for 30 minutes and talk through these things. Sometimes they have it on the the schedule every week, and then there's some weeks where they may cancel it if they don't need to have it. You could also do that in Slack. You could have a check-in, but I do think it's still helpful to have FaceTime every, like maybe every other week at least. Again, just because it's different. Talking through stuff is different than slacking about things. So what we do is they have their team meetings and then we have a leadership team where it's just me and the managers every week on Tuesdays. And so generally speaking, like they've already talked to their teams before they talk to me and then we can collectively talk about the big picture stuff, raise any issues um, and go from there. And so that's our cadence every week. And like I said, we may cancel meetings if we don't need them, but they're on the calendar. I have dedicated time every week for that. And then in addition to that, because I am not personally meeting with both teams all the time, we have a monthly all hands meeting where everybody comes on and I lead the calls and I talk them through what's happening and goals and priorities, projects we're doing so they can see the big picture of where we're going. We'll talk about things that are going well, things that we need to do better. Sometimes we'll do training if there's a particular area that I feel like the team needs to hear all at once, especially hear it from me. We'll do training on those calls. But again, I think that having that time for the the FaceTime is really crucial, but doing it in a way that's efficient. So, you know, I've had clients tell me before that they spend, you know, half their week in team meetings because they may meet with like each team member individually. So I would say like, we have to figure out a way, a cadence for you to manage your team on a regular basis where it doesn't take all of your time. I think on this front, one of the things that you could do, and this could also fit under performance reviews, is to have KPIs for your business and for your team. I know we haven't really talked about KPIs that much. KPIs are key performance indicators or metrics that really tell you how your business is doing. And, you know, I have KPIs that I track every week in my scorecard. This is actually an area I could probably do better at, and I've talked to my team about it. But I think to be successful, if you really want to take it to the next level, you can give your team members KPIs. Say, hey, like, here's our company KPIs. Here's the goals. Here is the ways that you are impacting these KPIs and track those. So you can talk about these weekly or monthly or in your performance reviews. But I do think it's helpful to help have the actual team members see like, okay, I'm having this direct impact on this overall KPI and here's how I'm impacting the business. That's all I've got for how to lead and manage your team so you can create the right culture and build your dream team. So to recap quickly, we've got tone at the top, setting and communicating clear expectations, having performance reviews, delegating and training, and then weekly management and FaceTime. The last thing I want to end on is this little anecdote. I learned sometime back in my corporate life about being an effective leader. It's called being a window and a mirror. 
And sometimes I say it backwards, but I think you'll still get the point. (laughs) So an effective leader knows when to be a window versus a mirror. So if you're talking to clients or anybody or your team and somebody says to you, hey, this is going really well. This is great. They have praise for your, your team and your business. Or just when things are going well, you need to be the window, meaning you let all of that go through to your team. You pass it along to your team. You give your team the credit. You talk them up versus if somebody has negative feedback for you, you need to be the mirror, meaning it stops at you. You take responsibility for that thing that didn't go as planned, for the customer who's not happy, for the sales number that didn't get hit. Even if one of your team members didn't do what they were supposed to do, that's a separate conversation. Ultimately, it comes down to you as the leader to take responsibility for things happening the way that you want them to happen. And so you take responsibility for something happening, even if somebody else did something wrong by saying, okay, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to train. I'm going to communicate more clearly. I'm going to set better expectations. We're going to have performance reviews, whatever it is. You take the responsibility. And this is one where I've seen entrepreneurs, some of our, some clients who sometimes don't do that very well, they start playing the blame game. And what happens if you start blaming your team for when things are not going well is your team members are not happy. They're not going to stay. They're not going to perform well. They're not going to feel like they're in a supportive environment. So you need to know when to take responsibility as the leader versus when to pass through all of the praise and good stuff onto your team. All right. So that's all I've got for the team series. I hope that you guys enjoyed this. If you are in a place where you want to grow your own dream team, then I highly recommend you join Scaling Made Simple so that I can help you to hire and onboard and train and manage your team in a way that helps you scale your business profitably rather than hiring a team that ends up draining out your bank account. So go to sarahhyoung.com forward slash Black Friday to see if we've still got any openings for the Scaling Made Simple promo. You can also read all of the details at sarahhyoung.com forward slash scale. So you can see everything that is included in that program. So that is it for today. And I will see you back next week where we're going to talk about how to have your wealthiest year ever in 2024. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Listening and learning is great, but implementing what you learned is even better. So what's one thing you can do this week to make more money in your business, save for your financial future, and start living your most prosperous life? If you found this episode helpful, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts and share with a friend because it helps me reach more amazing female entrepreneurs like yourself. See you in next week's episode.